We'll start with your favorite, which is not ironic in that statement. It is actually your favorite, which is exercise. And so I think what would be helpful is you've talked about this before, but this kind of framework of the centenarian decathlon, do you want to just quickly state what that is? Because I think it kind of gives some grounding and foundation to how you think about exercise compared to how others may talk about it. Yeah. So there's so much I could say about this. I really thought you were going to throw me uh, the usual ball and start with nutrition, which of course is not my favorite, but we will talk about it. Um, but you're right. Exercise is my favorite and it is my favorite um, because I think the data are very clear that exercise, if leveraged to its capacity, has a greater impact on your lifespan. That's Remember, that's the how long you live piece and your health span, that's the how well you live piece, than any of the others, with the only exception potentially being emotional health, right? So there, you know, there's clearly going to be the case of the individual whose emotional health is in such ruins that until that is addressed, no amount of physical health matters. And in fact, any anything else is just prolongation of agony. But if, if you exclude that case, which is, I don't want to minimize that case because I think there are many people who um, ha have been in that situation, um, exercise really is the, is the king of, of interventions. So you alluded to something that is one of my favorite um, topics, which is called the centenarian decathlon. So, uh, and again, I, I realize that some people have read the book and they understand what this means or they've heard me talk about it. But again, the purpose of this podcast, I think, is to make sure that someone who's new um, maybe maybe gets up to speed on this or it's a refresher for someone. So um, the Centenarian Decathlon is an idea that came to me in the summer of 2018. Um, and it's uh, it's an idea that occurred in an instant, but it was really the result of many years uh, probably four years of suffering, uh, so to speak. So the, the suffering started in, at the end of 2014 when I decided to stop competitively cycling. And not only did I stop cycling, but I was not going to go back to any other sport. So I was not going to be competing anymore in masters swimming, cycling, obviously had no desire to go back and compete in boxing or martial arts or anything like that. Basically, I was, I was done competing and all I wanted to do was exercise for the sake of exercise. And this, for me at least, was a bizarre foreign idea because from the age of 13 until that point in time, which was 41 or 42, I had never trained without a specific purpose. Every single rep, every single lap, every single pedal stroke, everything I ever did was always geared towards a purpose. And um, now for the first time ever, I was kind of like, huh, what should I do today? I guess I should go for a run. Okay, I guess I'll lift weights tomorrow. I'm in the gym lifting. What am I lifting for? Well, I used to do this. I guess I should still do this, you know, but it was like this totally rudderless existence that I had. And it stayed that way until the summer of 2018, when I was at the funeral of the parent of one of my best friends. And um, again, I, I uh, apologies for repeating this because I do write about this in the book. But basically, at that funeral, I realized that while my friend's uh, mom had died at a relatively old age, I think about 89, um, her physical life had basically demised so significantly in the past decade that her actual death was almost just a matter of uh, formality. But she had lost the ability to do the things that mattered to her most a decade earlier. So she couldn't play golf anymore because of her shoulder. She couldn't garden because of her knees and hips and back. I mean, she just couldn't, she couldn't even play with her grandkids. Um, and so she spent most of the last decade of her life largely uninvolved in anything. And, um, you know, did come down with dementia in the final year of her life. And that's what ultimately took her life. But, um, you, you know, 
I, I was just totally blown away by this person that I once remembered as being completely vibrant, losing everything and spending this last year uh, in this state. And I realized in that moment, as I literally sat in a church pew, first of all, this is really common. And, and, and secondly, this is what I want to train for. Like I, for the first time in four years realized, aha, the thing I want to train for is to avoid this. I want to come up with an event, an athletic event that will be done at the end of my life and everything between now and then will be training for it. And so I just came up with this idea called the centenarian decathlon, not because it implies that one has to live to a hundred to compete or not even to imply that it has to have 10 events, but simply as a mental model to say, what are the most important activities, both activities of daily living and activities of performance that I want to be able to do at the end of my life? And how well can I define them? How well can I understand the physical traits that will be necessary to execute them? And then how much can I reverse from there or backcast from there what I need to be doing today to increase the probability of doing those things tomorrow to the highest level? And that has become obviously a huge obsession of mine. As you know, uh, I, along with a couple of other folks, have started a company around this called 10 Squared, which is just geared towards training people to do this. Um, and I think that it is, at least until someone shows me a better idea, the best model for how to train if your goal is not something very specific. So again, if you came to me and said, you know, I know how much you love jujitsu. If you're like, look, I, there's this tournament coming up in six months and I really want to compete for it. That's not the centenarian decathlon. That's a very specific type of training you need to be doing in jujitsu to go and compete there. If, you know, my wife uh, is running the Boston marathon next year and she wants to, you know, run a certain time she will have nothing to do with training her centenary in decathlon. She is going to be doing very, very specific running workouts to make sure she hits her goals. So there are lots of other ways to train, but my point is that most people aren't training to be the best at their local jiu-jitsu tournament or to run their PR at the Boston Marathon. Uh, and even if they do those things, they're usually fleeting. And ultimately what people really wanna be training for is to be the most kick-ass versions of themselves in the last decade of their life. And you know, again, if that means your 80 to 90 years are functioning like you're a really good 70 year old, that's a totally different experience from what most people go through. And so let's say someone is training for the centenary decathlon. So they kind of agree and they say, you know, I want to put all my focus into this, which is how do I become like an athlete focused on life? Um, and we don't have to get into these in detail because in the show notes, we'll link to the multiple, multiple places we've talked about them. But what are the four components that you think are important for someone who is interested in training for the centenary decathlon? It starts on the foundation, right? You have to have stability. You have to have the chassis. Um, and that, you know, basically I'd say the chassis and the tires, right? So you have to, you have to have every aspect of the motor control, coordination, ability to dissipate force, uh, ability to receive force, um, ability to balance motor, you know, it, th there's so much that goes into stability that it, I think, got a, a full half chapter in the book. Um, and it's far and away the most complicated to explain, but it's really obvious to see it when it's not there. So, you know, this is, every one of us is lacking in stability. And it was the biggest re-education for me as I pivoted to this way of training. Um, so it's, it's everything from learning how to appropriately pressurize your intra-abdominal space to how to um, unlock your ribs, maintain an appropriate center of gravity, how to 
be able to isometrically contract muscles as necessary, how to be able to do it under control, how to have good foot mechanics, right? I mean, all of these things we've done dedicated podcasts on because each component of this stability game is, is quite nuanced. Um, and the good news is while most of us show up to the middle part of our life with enormous deficits here, they're all retrainable. We're, we're actually still quite plastic in our old age. Second component is strength. Um, and I would say a subcomponent of strength is power. So even though we lose power very quickly as we age, the more we can maintain it, the better. And you can't have power without strength and stability. Um, <clears throat> the third component, uh, and this is really more of a continuum. The third and fourth are part of a continuum of cardiorespiratory fitness. But we think of this, you know, I talk about this as being a triangle. So the base of the triangle is the aerobic efficiency. So this is the, you know, maximum fat oxidation ability. This is your all day pace. We want that to be as high as possible. And then the peak of the triangle is the VO2 max. That's, you know, most adequately thought of as the engine size. So that's the peak aerobic output. So those are, those are the four components. And one of the exercises we do with both our patients and, and, and the, obviously the, the clients in 10 squared is once you have a person's centenary and decathlon goals, you break them down into what is required. So if you, if you give me your list and you, you know, we can take that list and we can say, oh, this requires a VO2 max of 31 milliliters per kilogram per minute. This requires, uh, an ability to sit this, you know, this way, or this requires this much strength in this domain. This requires this type of hip loading, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can evaluate where a person is today and then say, oh, okay, well, obviously today you can do all of those things, but here's the predicted trajectory of decline on each of those things. And will you be above your benchmarks in 40 years or will you be below them? And for most of us, myself included, uh, at least on some of those dimensions, you're actually considerably below them at your target. And therefore you have to raise the performance currently to make sure you hit the targets in the future. And like we mentioned, for anyone who is interested in further on anything exercise in the show notes, we'll link to the multiple podcasts, articles, et cetera, so people can dive in. 